Hello, everyone. This is Father Doug Scharf. And I'm David Dixon. And welcome once again to our weekly podcast, Sunday Ready. Our readings for this week are found in Ezekiel chapter 17, verses 22 through 24, Psalm 92, and selected verses 1 through 4 and 11 through 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10 and 14 through 17, and the Gospel of Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 34. Great. Thank you, David. How are you doing today? Doing good. How about you? We're doing great. Thank you. Awesome. So last week, we talked about the fact that we are entering this long season after Pentecost, this this ordinary time. And so for those who are regular listeners to this podcast, we're going to make a slight change in how we uh, talk about the readings. We're going to start um, with the gospel reading each week and then go back to the Old Testament and the Psalm and the Epistle. And the reason we're going to do that is that during this ordinary time, the readings are really connected thematically, especially the Old Testament with the gospel reading. So until you know what the gospel reading is going to be, the other readings don't make quite as much sense. So we're going to kind of do things a little bit differently to kind of connect and hopefully make those themes um, clearer uh, so that when you come and and hear the readings, you'll know what that theme is and can be uh, listening for it. So we're going to start with the Gospel of Mark, um, chapter 4, verses 26 through 34. And the first thing I would note here, David, is really kind of at the end of the Gospel reading, where Jesus talks about the fact that his primary mode of teaching Mm -hmm. is in parables. And so this is one of the few occasions where Jesus actually says, this is how I'm going to teach. I'm not going to make things plain, but I'm going to teach you in parables. Right. Uh, of course, parable, uh, I believe, is from the Greek word paraboli, bola, uh, which is parabolic, which means to come alongside. Um, and so, you know, parables are funny things, right? When you think you have them figured out, <laughs> you need to back off and understand. It's pro- if, if you come up with an obvious uh, explanation of the parable, it's probably not <laughs> the direction Jesus is trying to take it, right? Yeah, so I, I w- what I would say is that they're not allegories, right? It, right. They're, they're not meant to be interpreted where everything represents something else. They're multi-layered, multi-faceted. And as you said, every time you think you kind of have one figured out, the next time you read it or hear it, you hear it differently and something else jumps out at you. Right, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, the parable, he talks about the kingdom of God in parable. And uh, of course, during, as you were saying previously, this season, this long season, um, we use the color green liturgically, which represents growth and, and life. And it is in this season that we're going to hear almost weekly something about the kingdom of God, some teaching regarding the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? How do you live in the kingdom of God? Those kind of principles are going to be uh, kind of laid out. And so he starts off here talking about the kingdom of God being something, as uh, you had mentioned earlier, kind of mysterious with using parable, right? You don't have it completely figured out. And Jesus does that purposely because the kingdom of God is not something you figure out right? The kingdom of God is something you live into. You experientially walk into the kingdom of God. And here he talks about uh, seed. uh, And I I kind of like this picture of the kingdom of God being something very small, but producing something very grand. Right. Yeah, exactly. And um, when I was in Israel on a pilgrimage uh, several years ago, we had the opportunity of walking around the Sea of Galilee and around, you know, many of the places where we know historically Jesus um, lived and exercised his ministry. And many of the things that we find in the parables, like seeds and birds and crops and wheat, um, are right there in, in the landscape around where Jesus would have been 
living and doing his ministry with his disciples. So I can almost picture Jesus walking along the Galilean seashore and asking this question, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or here's a mustard plant, right? It's sort of like this. Right. Um, And as you said, it's mysterious. It's not it's not exactly like this, but it's, right. there's a comparison. There's something that that we can learn from these natural examples around us about what this spiritual reality that Jesus came to show us is all about. Right. And um, I kind of like uh, the uh, verbiage in the King James uh, translation. When Jesus talks about the kingdom, you typically find this phrase, the kingdom of God is like unto. Mm-hmm. A rock, for instance. He's not saying it is a rock, but he's saying that if you understand something of the quality of a rock, there's something about the kingdom of God that is like unto that. So you'll right. understand something about the in workings of the kingdom of God. And so he uses, of course, as you were saying, seed here and uses a farmer, you know, planting in, in the ground and You know, what is he trying to tell us? Is he talking about patience? You know, the farmer has to be patient, right? You have to plant the seed and just, you know, wait for it to do what it has, is supposed to do. Is he talking about grace here, right? I mean, the grace of something coming to life and growing and producing. And of course, mystery is all mixed up in in that. I, I think there's so much that can be said about Uh, the seed and the kingdom of God and life and how growth comes. Um, Yeah. I think there's just a lot right here that could be unpacked. I mean, these are images that we can go back to over and over again. I mean, just the image of the seed itself in terms of dying and rising and plunging into darkness and emerging into light. I mean, all of these patterns that we see, in our, in our own experience um, are represented by this simple example of the seed. But I think it's important to know that these were images, as I mentioned, that were, that were um, so familiar to mm-hmm. Jesus and his first followers that these were right. natural things that he could point to yeah. as examples because this was an agrarian society. Right. If Jesus was living in 21st century America and teaching using parables, he may not have pointed to you know, images of farming and and growing. Um, He might have used technology. He might have used other things that are familiar to us that we could connect to because that's what he's doing here in terms of using these familiar images. I I like that. It It is the familiar that we find and interact with in the everydayness of life. I I really think that's one thing to understand about the kingdom of God is that it is not totally otherworldly. Mm-hmm. It is found right here in the everydayness of your life. Yeah. And since Jesus did use these agricultural images of seeds and crops and plants, um, that's why uh, our Old Testament lesson, if we want to turn to that from Ezekiel 17, um, begins. And we're going to hear this reading first on Sunday, of course, from the Old Testament. But it's these images of of God telling uh, Israel through uh, the prophet Ezekiel um, that I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of a cedar. I will set it off, and it's it's this image of of growth and 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 uh, maturity and and development um, using this this image of of the tree or the plant. Yeah, it's uh, it echoes somewhat of Isaiah's uh, yeah. kind of messianic uh, promise concerning the branch of Jesse, a stem out of the yeah. branch or the offspring of Jesse, of course, referring to Jesus. Um, yeah, it's uh, the setting of this. Uh, of course, they're in exile in Babylon, and Ezekiel is among the exiles. He mm-hmm. finds himself there, and it has not been an easy experience, right? I mean, it, they have experienced so much in terms of oppression and loss and uh, just complete displacement. And it's striking to me that in the midst of that kind of experience that these exiles were going through, God gives this vision, this grand vision to Ezekiel of Mm -hmm. something spectacular. Right. Um, And, and that just is so mind blowing to me that, 
it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. God is still sovereign. Yeah. God is still on the throne. God has not vacated the throne, right? I mean, God is still right. ruling and reigning, even when it, in the midst of trouble, in the midst of conflict, in the midst of the messiness that you find yourself in. And then the prophet just starts talking really about the kingdom of God. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, um, and it's, it's an image of abundance, right? It's just like the mustard seed in the gospel that starts out small and grows large. Um, it will be on the mountain height of Israel. I will plant it in order that it might bear fruit and become a noble cedar. But the thing I wanted to point out here, and I, I just sort of caught this as I was reading in preparation for this uh, recording, towards the end of this passage from Ezekiel 17, there is this inversion. And we see this like in the Magnificat, Mary's song. We see it in Isaiah and other places. I will bring low the high tree. I will make high the low tree. I will dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish, right? So um, it kind of, I will humble those who are proud. I will uh, exalt those who are humble. So this kingdom of God, and Jesus, I think, alludes to this a lot in the parables, is an upside down kingdom, right? right? It's, it's um, there is this overturning of the order of this world in order for the justice and vision and mercy and grace of the kingdom to be made manifest. And there is an insight into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God upsets norms. Yeah. I mean, it just Amen. invades the everydayness and turns things on their head, right? Yeah. It gives you an alternate perspective. Yeah. Uh, we're so, and especially in the climate we've been experiencing, we're so accustomed to seeing things as we experience as opposed to seeing how others may experience the thing. It's kind of like uh, I was thinking, uh, having some conversations about, you know, it's sometimes it's tough. And this is what the prophet has done. He's, he's speaking God's word in the messiness of politics of his day. Right. right. Um, and I was having a conversation and trying to explain something. And uh, the metaphor of a lighthouse comes into play and you know the lighthouse is there and it's great for people who are on the sea and it said you know the lighthouse is basically telling those on the on the sea i've got you just follow this light but there are inlanders who are trying to sleep who want someone to turn the light out <laughs> right on the lighthouse because it's annoying it's bothering me that's the kingdom of god the kingdom of god is going to do something over here that is wonderful and grand, but over here, I might not see it as wonderful and grand for me in that experience in that moment of my life. It's, it is that kind of experience entering into the kingdom of God that just turns things on its head and gives you an alternate perspective and experience. Well, and I think um, that's exactly what happens in the gospels to Jesus. Uh, there were many who welcomed the message until they really thought about the implications. Right. And they thought about how it would affect their lives. And in many cases, not all, but in many cases, those are the ones that then either walked away or uh, turned and became the adversaries of Jesus and ultimately led to um, his, his arrest um, right. and his passion and death. Um, you know, there was more to it than just that. But, but at, a, at a very basic level, the, the, the message of the kingdom of God um, was not welcomed. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's interesting. One way I heard someone put it is the people in Jesus's day were not anti-God. They were pro-God. They were just anti-Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's really it because there's, that's where the challenge is. Right? And in many cases, they felt like they were protecting and guarding what they, you know, held fast to be true. Right. Um, you know, in the face of, I mean, we heard it this this past Sunday, the the, uh, the June sixth readings, where they thought Jesus was crazy and possessed by the devil. Exactly. Right? I mean, so their their reactions were were not, um, you know, just we don't like this guy. They thought it was a fundamental threat to right. what they believed to be true. Um, mm -hmm. So and, and what, to the order of the day, and there to the order of the day. That's right. Setting up the norms and the order of the day. Let's move on to Psalm 92. Um, thematically, in, in verse um, 11 and 12, we again have this image of the tree. 
the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. Uh, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. So again, the, the gospel has this image of the mustard seed and the plants flourishing. Ezekiel gives the image of Israel, the house right. of Israel flourishing. And now the psalm echoes these images of abundance. So um, thematically, those are the connections. Mm -hmm. But it's a powerful song uh, of thanksgiving and praise, right, yes. when, when you read the whole thing. It is absolutely, and um, I think saying and all saying uh, the, all that we've been saying, I think it's important to point out how this relates to community as well. Yeah. Those who were in exile, and in this particular psalm, the trees of the field, all of that. It's it's there's something about community within the uh, uh, kingdom of God that's important for us to always keep in mind. As, as we come to this. But what sticks out to me on some of this psalm here is uh, verse two, to tell of your loving kindness early in the morning and of your faithfulness in the night season. Start your day and end your day with prayer. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's, it's just a powerful reminder that folks, let's just get up and say a prayer. Yeah. And when we come home to go to bed, let's just say another prayer. You yeah. Know? yeah. <laughs> well, and in many ways, the, the monastic rhythms of prayer um, are based on what we read in the Psalms, right? You know, seven times a day, I will praise you, right? So, I mean, all of these uh, time stamps that we sort of find in the Psalms, uh, people have emulated that, right. you know, but you're right, that most basic level, get up, pray, go to bed, and right. pray. If, you, if, we right. did, if everybody did that, <laughs> um, we'd, we'd be in a better place, I think. Uh, oh, yeah. Anyways. And I also like in verse four how uh, the writer says, and I shout for joy because of the works of your hand. God's work is a reason to be happy, yeah. is a reason to have joy. God's work is a good work, right? And yeah. so that gives us this response God's work is wonderful. I'm going to shout for joy. I'm, I'm going to be elated because of what God has done and God continues to do. It's a good thing. It's a very good thing. And um, I had a friend of mine who's a priest. He taught on joy one time and he said, you know, we have all these um, canticles and psalms that we say as part of our liturgy. They all talk about joy, um, but we don't usually sound very joyful when we say <laughs> them, right? You know, Um you know, be joyful in the Lord, all you lands, you know, right. um, enter his gates with thanksgiving, go into his courts with praise, right? All of these, all the, and we, and we say them sort of in this monotone um, voice. True. It, <laughs> um, and yet these are shouts of joy. These are Absolutely. shouts of acclamation about what God has done. Yeah. yeah, great. And I think the one other thing to point out would be, they shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be green and succulent. Age does not prevent God from using you. You are not done yeah. until you are laid in the grave. Yeah. Well, and I'll, I'll use this as a bridge to take us to Second Corinthians. I want to go back to something you said earlier about the trees clapping their hands, right? These images of creation participating in the worship and praise of God. And this is not the only psalm that does this. And right. Um, for me and for, for many others that I sort of read and, and um, engage with scholars in terms of scholarship and stuff, they, they look at that and say, these are images of all of creation participating in the redemptive work of Christ, right? Awesome. This, this image of new creation that we see in the book of Revelation and that we're going to see in 2 Corinthians here in a moment um, is an image that encompasses the fullness of God's good creation right. that participate in that. Um, and so if we turn to second Corinthians, uh, this has one of my favorite verses in the new Testament. It's fairly well known, um, towards the end of the reading. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. And I like to remind people that, um, there's no being verb between, um, in Christ and new creation in the right. Greek. It's simply an exclamation. Yeah. If anyone is in Christ, new creation. New creation. Right? It's just, <laughs> exactly. There it is. That's it. Um, and, and Bishop N.T. Wright, who I, who I follow a lot, he likes to say, you know, that that means that every Christian is a bit, it's a, there, we are each a piece of that new creation right? Um, through baptism and through our relationship with Christ. Yeah, 
That's awesome. That's, uh, that is so right on. Um, yeah. If you are in Christ, new creation, that's who you are now. The old has passed and continues to pass away. Yeah. And behold, and the, the uh, King James says, behold, here it says, see, to see fully, to see three-dimensionally, all things have become new. And it's, it's a perspective that we have to take, mm -hmm. right? See, behold, the new, right, is right here. And so I think it's that perspective shift that we hear about when the kingdom of God is preached in the gospel, repent, perspective shift, change yeah. your mind, yeah. get a different view of what's going on in the world around you and with God and with yourself. So I think that's very clear with what uh, Paul is talking about here. And that's, and that's a great setup because, you know, that is so powerful, right? This image of new creation, behold, the new has come and that change of perspective. And, you know, this is one of those quotes that people take out and it's on bookmarks and it's on Bible covers and it's on, you know, bumper stickers, whatever, you know, it's one of those kind of pull quotes that people like to hold on to. But in context, if you listen to this whole reading from second Corinthians, the way we get there is through the process of death and resurrection, That's right. right? For the love of God urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. Mm -hmm. And he died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves. Um, you know, it's this whole Paschal mystery that we move right. through death. And we have been crucified with Christ, Paul right. says. Yeah. So the new creation comes out of that dying and rising experience and there's something we all have to go through that there's something very powerful uh, of course uh and theologically the term is soteriology right it's right. the theology of salvation you know our studying it and figuring it out and understanding it and applying it or whatnot you know typically there's kind of two ideas of salvation that i've been acquainted with one is substitutionary salvation is substitutionary meaning jesus died for me mm -hmm. There's some problems with that, right? And we could break down all the problems with that. I'm not going to. But then there's also this view of vicarious salvation, that Jesus didn't die for me. Jesus died as me, mm -hmm. as with Paul saying, I am crucified with Christ. So when Jesus died on the cross, he was the last Adam. There's no more Adams. The Adam died. The old me has died. And now I'm living this new life in Christ. It's a brand new life that, that you know, Paul is talking about here. It's everything has become new. And he talks about the mind of Christ and, and those uh, different aspects of your salvation that you live into and experience. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that a lot. And uh, as someone put it, I forget who, you know, Jesus is the only one who completely passes through death. Mm and overcomes it and comes out the other side, right? And, and because he has, he has forged that pathway for us, right. there's still a passing through death, yeah. right? But, but it's not the last word anymore, right? right. It now has, there, there is another side to that that is resurrection. Exactly. But if, we, if you read the New Testament and think, oh, you know, it's all about new life and new creation and, and resurrection, well, it is. But we are all participants in the Paschal mystery. We have That's all right. been crucified with Christ. We all die and rise again. Yeah. And I think to sort of bring this all to a, to a summary, this whole theme that we talked about in the gospel about the seed um, is the perfect image for that dying and rising, yes. right? The seed that has to be plunged into the ground um, and die, essentially, is then what gives, um, gives rise to the abundance and, and the abundant fruit. Right. Amen. Well, we hope to see you Sunday, uh, June 13th. And um, thank you for listening. Have a great week, everybody. And God bless you. You forgot your tagline.